29, rugged in the skies, was designed to carry heavy loads high, fast, and far. But on the ground, she's a fish out of water. She can't take the kind of beating you'd give a jeep. Taxiing, parking, towing, mooring, these jobs call for careful handling. Hand signals are the pilot's only instruments for navigating hazardous taxiways. And to the men who control this heavy airplane and know its terrific momentum, almost any ground course is hazardous. But with an emergency brake, plus the foot brakes, and engines at 700 RPM, this plane is ready to stop short of trouble. She goes where you lead her. A sign from that finger will press his foot on the right brake and swing her into the lane. Brakes are used to control direction. The nose wheel responds quickly to slight brake pressure. On the turn, all engines are kept at idling speed. The nose wheel does the work. Pivoting on one wheel would tend to damage the tires, but this rolling turn puts little strain on treads or sidewalls. And when you're round the bend, point the nose wheel forward. Here, the left brake will do the trick. When the plane has been brought up straight ahead, it's time to stop for a checkup. The parking brake goes on. Magneto check. That's one for the engineer. The magneto check should be limited to a few seconds per engine at the most. These engines were built to pull her at high speed in the air, but running them too long on the ground will overheat them. Engines are run up to 2,000 RPM for the test. Both. Right. Both. Left. Both. Number two engine. Bombay doors on the B-29 now open pneumatically. Formerly, doors operated electrically had to be opened on the run-up of number one or number four engine to provide enough electrical power. The pilot, inboard air uncovered, keeps radio on command in contact with the tower, while the co-pilot's on interphone to relay orders to the crew. With all engines checked, she's ready to roll, but the pilot's going to wait for the signal from his crew chief. All clear, give him the flash. That means brakes off. Throttles are advanced to about 1,000 RPM to start this 60 tons of airplane down the lane. Then back come the throttles to idling. Taxiing speed is not the result of engine speed. Momentum does the trick. Wing men are needed to check clearances in the tight spots. How's hydraulic pressure? Okay. When the going is close, it's up to the men on the ground to keep the flight crew posted. Crew chiefs, the pilot's key man when trouble looms ahead. Where planes are parked or other obstacles stand in the way, watch those wings. How close? A yard? A foot? Hold it. Hold everything. Better check. Crew chief is referee on close decisions. It's first down by inches and goal to goal. There's the signal. And it's straight through center. On this man's team, whatever position you play, you've got to remember to go easy on those engines, brakes, and tires. 
This game's played with three quarterbacks, the crew chief and two wingmen. Keep your eyes open, your signals clear. Remember, RPM at 700 idling speed once the plane is rolling. She'll ride on momentum. Racing the engines would overheat them, and when it's necessary to stop, well, there'd be danger of burning the brakes. Excessive braking might pivot those 60 tons on one set of tires. Roll through the turns. Let her follow her nose as much as possible. Take it easy. those engines to 1200 to clear them, then cut them. Now you're ready for parking. The equipment for the job is stowed in the rear compartments. The putt-putt should be switched over to idle first, however, and turn off the generator. Wait a few minutes before turning off the ignition. In a plane as heavy and as high-powered as the B-29, such additional weight as chocks, braces, covers, and other parking and mooring equipment, when properly stowed, can be carried with her at all times without making a great difference in her performance. Chocks are first. Get them set in place at once so the brakes can be released. Set the chocks a couple of inches away from the wheels. Too close, they might get wedged in there when the plane pulls forward on engine run-up. Ropes should be laid out on the ground where you can reach them easily. The pilot will release the parking brakes when all the chocks are set. Now there's more to parking than just putting on gimmicks. There's the Form 1A, for instance, and the flight engineer will be waiting to turn it over to the crew chief. You know, there's lots of things that don't go down on paper very well. Things it takes hands to see. Things that hands make it easier to see. Checking this over, however, doesn't suspend other operations. Static lines for the tail and nose should go on early. There are permanent ground wires on the landing gear, of course, but special danger on refueling makes additional lines a must. Clamps guarantee that static goes into the ground. Consider their speed in flight, the metal they contain, and the equipment installed, and you'll have some idea of the real danger these planes face from static electricity. Another tough deal, easily avoided, is the chance that safety switches on the landing gear might fail in an emergency. This plane would go down on its nose or belly so fast and so flat, you'd never be able to pick it up again whole. So an important part of the B-29's parking gear is a set of braces to keep the wheels on the ground and the plane standing on them. The brace is placed with one leg against the oleo and the other against the drag strut. Each brace carries a red streamer as a warning signal. This streamer should be allowed to hang free. There are braces for each of the three landing gears. Watch those streamers. Next to go on are wheel covers. Gasoline and oil drippings are pretty tough on rubber. Those breathers on the 29's engines could turn into trash collectors in a good windstorm. Parking equipment includes pads to cover the openings. Set them so the red streamers fly free. Most of the gadgets are installed now, except, of course, the pedo covers. They're usually carried in the forward compartment. As air intakes, the pitots are delicate instruments and must be protected whenever the plane is on the ground. Don't give moisture and dust a chance to do their dirty work. Here, too, the red streamer should fly free. Make sure the cover is on tight. Last job before your plane is buttoned down is to check the position of all electrical switches and throttles. An open switch could kick up a terrific mess. Don't assume the engineer took care of this detail. Check it yourself, with your eyes and your hands. Same thing goes for switches in the pilot's aisle stand. Bomb doors stay open, of course, so gas fumes won't accumulate in the bomb bays. Check the engine and surface controls to make sure they're locked. Make sure also that the pilot's and co-pilot's windows are closed and locked. All such details in parking the plane are vital but they don't actually take long, probably about the time it takes for the flight crew to leave the plane. And when these details are done, you're done.
that is, except for the jobs that turned up on the engineer's Form 1A. Towing 60 tons of B-29 out of a hangar isn't kids' play, but it doesn't have to be hard either in spite of slick floors and other hazards. Mix some caution with a dash of practical mechanics and the job is a cinch. A pair of towing cables carried in the cleat rack behind the driver's seat will do the trick. One cable for each of the main wheels. A little time spent here in laying them out on the ground and unwrinkling the kinks is a handy precaution against having one or both of them snap. The tow line from the winch and the cleat rack's chin should be played out carefully for the same reason. While you're getting this done, two other guys can be attaching the tow bar to the nose gear knuckle. Four strong hands on that bar will keep her on the straight and narrow. Now, you'll need a man up in the cockpit to work Annie's brakes. First, however, he'll have to check hydraulic pressure. Both gauges must show between 800 and 1,000 PSI. To maintain that pressure, the hydraulic pump motor will draw on the batteries, so the putt-putt will have to be started. When the word has been passed along, the necessary electrical switches can be turned on, including, of course, the putt-putt ignition switch. The putt-putt on this plane carries an early type switch panel. But there's one rule for all, about five minutes warm-up before switching to run. Now, if the kinks are all out of the cables, you can hook onto the main landing gear struts and take away the chocks. Stow the chocks in the cleat rack for the time being. Hook the cleat rack's winch line onto the cables from the main landing gear, and the towing mechanism is complete. A nicely balanced V, able to give a good even pull. Now, with the putt-putt running, ladders stowed, and ground wires disconnected, coiled, and placed in the rear compartment ready for use, the airplane is about ready to head for open country. The path is cleared, her wheels are free to roll when the brakes are released. And she has two men at the nose to guide her. Check every step of the operation. Don't trust the luck. But before she rolls, there's slack to take up in that tow cable. Get you set for a steady starting pull on both sets of wheels. Now, it's a good idea to check with your forward crew, particularly the men in the wings. Chances are they're only headed for a pleasant walk into the sunlight, but on the other hand, that clearance over there might be less than you think. Ready now to release the parking brakes. Impress on the man in the cockpit that he should keep his feet off the brake pedals until he gets a signal from the chief. The slightest touch could jerk that tow bar and flatten out those two men guiding it. Now, when you've checked up in the tow line, you're set to go. Pass the word on to the driver. Remember, the first pull should be firm but steady. Don't kid yourself that just because the wheels seem to roll easily, they're not putting plenty of strain on the tow line. Keep a sharp eye on that skyscraper rudder as it clears the door. And just as in taxiing, put a watchman at each wingtip, too. There's no automatic pilot for this job. It takes watching eyes and foot rule judgment all the way. None of these jobs was laid out by armchair pilots who've never seen the inside of a hangar. In most cases, they've been figured out by men who've been doing the work and learning from their mistakes. Someday, some guy may find an even simpler way of doing this job, but it's a hundred to one you won't be able to eliminate safety precautions. Incidentally, it's okay to put the cleat track on the nose bar and push the plane, provided you're on a smooth surface where she'll roll with minimum effort. When you've got room enough to swing her around, the wingmen can detach the cables and get ready to tow her forward. Cables should be stowed in the cleat track and the tow line reeled in. You won't need them anymore this trip. You maneuver this plane forward the way a circus trainer pulls an elephant into the ring by the bar hooked into her nose. That's another one of the advantages of the tricycle landing gear. You can pull Annie and steer her with that one short bar. And response, but good. Be sure the tow bar is firmly attached and you're on your way again. So it's brakes off. The tow bar is built to stand a little less pull than the nose gear. 
If Annie won't budge, you can be darn sure the bar will break long before she gets herself torn limb from limb. You don't have to try proving that, of course. But a broken tow bar is a lot easier to replace than a broken nose gear any day. Using the bar for forward towing keeps your plane under maximum control because the nose wheel swings so easily. The We Think of Everything department has put a pair of stops on either side of the gear to keep the wheel from swinging too far. Those stops are set to allow a 68 degree swing in either direction and don't tow with the stops engaged. It's well to remember that your Kletak driver can't get away with one of his sensational open field pivots, not with all that tonnage tagging him around. Take all the space you have and swing it easy. Treat Annie right and she's a docile old girl. Follows you like you had a bag full of peanuts. Remember, you've got to use a lot of patience and a lot of caution in handling this huge piece of equipment. When she's in the air, she's nobody's fool. But when she's on the ground, she's out of her element. And brother, that calls for caution. Bad weather in airplanes get along like cats and dogs, and a good wind could whip a plane around like a weather vane while you're blinking a speck of dust out of your eye, especially if that plane has wing and tail the size of the B-29s. When the command comes to tie your plane down to earth, there's a few things about this particular design that will make the job different from other heavy aircraft. The various anti-weather gadgets to protect the plane are stowed in both rear compartments, along with the rest of her ground paraphernalia. First of all, you're going to need four lengths of mooring rope. The tie-down fitting for the nose is on the rear wall of the wheel well, just forward of the turret, where a good stout knot that won't slip, a bowline, for instance, is essential. This guy, of course, has been practicing, but if the Navy can do it, so can you. When you tie the other end into the ramp, you'll have to detach the ground wire first. Another of those can't-slip bowlines is needed here. Draw this line up fairly close, no need here for slack. And before you pull out, remember that ground clamp has to go back where you found it. Eye bolt fittings for tying down the wings are located near station 539. When you're tying into the ground fitting under the wing, leave plenty of slack in the line. About two feet is required. Another line goes on the tail skid, and you've got to reclamp the ground wire. A little slack is needed here, too. Be sure the main entrance door is closed, and that things that might get tossed around by the breeze are left flat on the ground or stowed away. Dust and sand riding the wing can make the finest precision instrument about as effective as a leaky bucket. See that the doors to the pressurized compartments are tightly closed. Up in the cockpit, two important details have to be taken care of. You'll need the battery switch for the first job, closing the cowl flaps. This is going to take a little time. Those cowl flaps close slowly, so don't be in a rush. Let them get fully closed. Give those engines a fighting chance against sand, dust, and moisture. Battery switch off. The second inside job is to check the windows and see that the flight controls are securely locked. Now when you're sure you've put out the cat and turned off the water heater, your housework is done. So down the hatch and pull the door closed after you. See that the latch is locked too. And when you're through, your men outside should have things practically ship shape for a final checkup. Make sure that the air scoop covers are installed and that the red streamers are flying clear. You never know when a pigeon's going to scoot in there while the storm is on. Check the pedo covers. Make sure they're on tight and that the red streamer is free. Get the stands away from the plane, too. She should be ready now for whatever the four winds blow. Playing the wind, you play for luck. Stack the cards for your B-29. Maybe dirty poker, but slipper the winning hand. 
in ground handling, careful attention to details, plus caution, will help keep these Tokyo Raiders fit for their job. Checking on the V-29. Checking mags and engine performance. Looking for trouble. Trouble is pretty obvious when an engine is behaving like this one. It's just been run up for a mag check, and still, it's smoking like a chimney. The engine won't idle. Not at 700 RPM, the way it should. Whenever you throttle it back, it starts conking out. Finally, the engine strangles and dies. That's an extreme case of a too rich idle mixture. But it may not be the only one. You run the next one up. It performs okay, although it's throwing a little smoke. After the run up, you throttle back to check idling speed. This one idles. The tax stabilizes at 700, fine. That's the time to move the mixture control to idle cutoff and watch the tack. If it rises more than about 10 RPM, idling mixture is too rich. If it dropped immediately, mixture would be too lean. It should hold steady or rise very slightly before dropping. You run the remaining engines up, clear them out, and cut them. You know the score on all four engines because you included a check of carburetor idle mixtures in your engine pre-flight, and knowing the score is half the battle. Engines one and two are okay. Carburetors on three and four need idle adjustment. That won't take long, but it can be life insurance for the engines and for the men aboard the plane when it takes off. Get the story straight and your signals clear. Have a man up forward to relay information from the inside of the plane to the outside so that you'll know about everything. Switches, for instance. You never take them for granted at any time. Having switches off comes first. You want to be plenty sure of them before you start any work on the engines. You remove the access door on the left side of the nacelle to adjust the carburetor idle valve. A special tool helps here because of spring tension on the valve's adjustment unit. This tool with a 7 8 inch opening makes it easier to lift the unit so it can be turned. But this one doesn't turn. That means it's probably jammed at full rich position. Somebody has worked on that valve with more muscle and knowledge. The valve will have to be removed before you can adjust it. That means first disconnecting the throttle control rod from the throttle lever after you've carefully counted the serrations on the lever or marked them with a pencil so you can put the rod back exactly where you found it. With the cotter key out, it's a simple matter to disconnect the rod with a couple of wrenches. The reason you want the lever free is because you want some play in it when you're removing and replacing the idle valve. The valve and this lever are interconnected inside. You get the nut and the washer off, being careful not to drop them. Then with the control rod out of the way, you replace the nut and washer so they won't get lost. The throttle lever is free to move. Now you're ready to go ahead and remove the idle valve from the carburetor. There are two safety castle nuts holding it in place. The whole assembly can be removed when these nuts have been taken off. And with that throttle lever already free, the valve assembly should lift out easily. Under the castle nuts, you will find some washers. 
You take these off before the valve springs them off and loses them for you. Then the valve assembly lifts out. And when it does, if the gasket under it is okay, you leave it where it is. Now let's see about this valve. If it's jammed so that you can't turn it by hand, you'll have to use a wrench. That idle adjustment screw on the valve has to turn freely or valve adjustment is impossible. A quarter turn unlocks the valve from the shaft which connects it to the adjustment unit. Then with the valve wrapped in cloth so it won't be marred in any way, a clockwise turn with a small wrench does the trick. The screw has a left hand thread so it turns out clockwise. Idle mixture is adjusted by turning this screw in or out of the valve. The farther out the screw is turned, the longer that valve will be in effective length and the farther it will reach up into that flange assembly. The higher it reaches, the more it closes off the fuel passage. And the smaller that passage is, the leaner the mixture will be. To regulate valve movement, the adjustment unit includes a fine adjustment knob with 20 serrations, which make definite clicks. With each click, the knob turns the valve on the screw about 1 20th of a full turn. On the underside of the knob is a pin, which limits the travel of the knob when it hits a similar pin on the ring below. The ring for course adjustment never turns without lifting. It has only eight positions, so the least it will turn the valve on the screw is a one-eighth turn. Before the valve can be adjusted, however, it has to be installed. If you had X-ray eyes and could look right into the valve assembly socket on the carburetor, you'd see that it's pretty deep, and down at the bottom of it is the idle control lever onto which you have to hook the screw end of the valve. To do that easily, you use another special tool, a sort of extension for the valve, a 5 16 bolt with a pin in its cotter key hole. When you've got the valve out, you fit the pin end of the tool onto it. A slight turn locks it in, a spring provides compression to hold it there, and you've got something to help you feel your way in hooking that valve over the lever. You jiggle a throttle until the valve is caught. Then with the throttle open, the valve can't slip off when you twist the tool out of the valve and remove it. Now's a good time to check the fiber gasket and make sure it's okay before installing the rest of the assembly, beginning with the idle control spring. Into the slotted opening at the top of the valve in which you lock the pin on the valve tool, you're now going to have to fit the crosswise retaining pin on the shaft of the flange assembly. That means you may have to turn the adjustment knob to install the assembly, and after that, turn it some more to lock the valve and the shaft together. Then when you've checked for freedom of movement to make sure the valve isn't binding, you're ready to install the castle nuts and their washers and anchor the whole valve assembly securely into position. With the valve all safety in place now, let's get an x-ray view of what's going to happen when you move the throttle lever to closed position and start turning the adjustment unit. With the tool used to lift the ring, the whole unit turns for coarse adjustment. Turning it counterclockwise toward rich position, you turn the shaft which fits